Welcome everybody. It is uh, with a great pleasure that I introduce to you Manolis Kellis. Dr. Kellis is a professor of computer science at uh, MIT, an institute uh, um, member of the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, and uh, a member of the computer science and artificial uh, intelligence lab at MIT, where he directs uh, the MIT computational uh, biology group. His research interests are in the area of computational biology, genomics, epigenomics, gene regulation, and gene evolution. Specifically, his group aims um, to further our understanding of the human genome by computational integration of large-scale functional and comparative genomics uh, datasets. To this end, Dr. Kellis has helped direct um, several uh, large-scale genomics projects including the integrative analysis efforts of the NIH Epigenome Roadmap Project, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements Project, and the uh, Genotype Tissue Expression Project. He has authored more than 150 uh, publications that have been cited more than 40,000 times. That is a huge number. Dr. Kelly's numerous awards include the U.S. Presidential Early Career Award in Science and Engineering, the NSF Award, a Career Award, the Alfred Sloan Fellowship. He, has a recognized, uh, he was recognized for his research in genomics as one of the top young investigators under the age of 35 by Technology Review Magazine, one of the principal investigators of the future by Genome Technology Magazine, and one of the three young scientists representing the next generation in biotechnology by the Boston Museum of Science. A native of Greece, he obtained his PhD from MIT, where uh, he received the Sprouse Award for the best doctorate thesis in computer science. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Manolis Kellis. All right, so thank you very much uh, for the very kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here and to be uh, surrounded by so many of you and such outstanding scientists, both in the panels and in the list of speakers. What I'd like to tell you about today is our work on trying to translate this amazing wealth of genomic information that we have gathered in recent years into enabling new therapeutic developments. And as you all know, the, the very reason that the human genome was sequenced was to understand uh, the genome biology sufficiently in order to enable um, new understandings of disease mechanism, to enable new target genes, to enable new therapeutics, and ultimately personalized medicine. And we've seen a lot of news about the Personalized Medicine Initiative and so many different endeavors that try to bridge, as we heard in the panel, the gap between basic biological discovery and ultimately translating things into new medicines. But there's a big challenge here. If you look at genome-wide association studies, which have very much been the workhorse of genomic discovery for disease mechanism, they give you regions of the genome that are significantly associated with disease. So basically you have here genomic position along the 23 chromosomes and uh, the, the p-value, the probability with which this association uh, is random and that probability is very, very small, making this association of FTO, a genetic locus uh, in this particular chromosome 16, uh, association with obesity and uh, BMI in particular, uh, as the strongest association in the genome. So when that was discovered in 2007, everybody was very excited. They basically said, great, we're soon going to have new therapeutics and, you know, new drugs for obesity. But it hasn't been the case. And the reason is that to go from this genetic association to the mechanism through which a particular disease region works is extremely laborious. And the reason for that is when you open up the hood and you ask what are these genetic differences that are associated with disease, what you find is dozens of these genetic mutations are co-inherited. That basically means that you cannot tell which one is the one responsible for the disease or which combination of mutations. The other problem is that in this particular example, and in 90% of cases, you actually don't have a single one of these mutations disrupting a protein. So we're faced with the big question of what do they actually do? 
And if you don't have any of them disrupting a protein, you don't even know what the target gene is. In the case of FTO, people assumed for, uh, you know, seven years that the target was FTO itself. Turns out they were very, very wrong. We showed last year that the target is actually 1.2 million nucleotides away. And that's something that no one would have expected uh, at the time, especially given how cleanly this region localizes into the center of the FTO gene. So then the question is, how do we now understand these non-coding mutations? And this is not some esoteric challenge or some you know, curious intellectual endeavor. This is 93% of disease regions from GWAS. They simply lack any protein alterations. So that basically means that if we, if we want to enable genomic medicine, we need to understand these non-coding associations. And that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to focus on the 98% of the genome that does not code for genes, that instead within it contains the regions that control gene expression and is the primary target of genetic disease from genome-wide association studies. So what do we need to know? We need to understand the causal variant within these regions. We need to understand the cell type of action. We need to understand the relevant pathways that are targeted and understand the mechanism. And there is hope. This is not just uh, an you know, unsolved problem. The NIH has, has invested a tremendous amount in building these reference maps of the human genome, mapping the human non-coding genome to great resolution through a series of epigenomic assays carried out in a large number of cell types. And I have been fortunate to be in involved in many of these uh, efforts. And we've basically used these data sets to link enhancers to their target genes, link them to their upstream regulators. We've used them to elucidate what are the intermediate molecular and cellular phenotypes on the way to disease. And that allows us to now go back into any one of these regions of association and start gaining a lot more information about the mechanism through which they work. And that's what I'm going to walk you through today. So number one, how do we even map the non-coding genome and how do we understand its circuitry? Number two, how do we find the disease-relevant tissues, cell types, variants, and regulators? Number three, how do we look at not just genetic variation between people, but also epigenetic information between people? So how does the regulatory genome change its activity from person to person? And how does that tell us, what does that tell us about disease? Then we're actually going to go back to this FTO example from the first slide, and we're going to look at how all these data have allowed us to now understand the mechanism and go and manipulate that mechanism. And then lastly, we're going to talk about how we can do this in much higher throughput to enable a systematic translation of more than 20,000 genome-wide association hits that are now simply uncharacterized into new therapeutics. So first of all, I'm going to start with this uh, publication from the Roadmap Epigenomics Project. This is an uh, international effort that basically led to a map of 111 different reference epigenomes across different cell types and tissues, which we have now used to understand human disease. Uh, what did we do in that project? We basically mapped three different classes of epigenetic modifications. Number one, DNA methylation, DNA accessibility, as well as the modifications of histone proteins that hold DNA together into chromatin. And we mapped those, as well as gene expression itself, in um, both embryonic tissues and adult tissues and individual uh, cells derived from those tissues. And the data we end up with looks like this. We basically have tracks across the entire genome, across all 3.2 billion nucleotides of the genome, that basically tell us for every one of these modifications, for DNA accessibility, for RNA expression, DNA methylation, chromo chromosomal interactions, where do these map across the genome? And what you can see here is this Pax5 gene appears to not have any of these active modifications, but have some repressed modifications here, indicating it's repressed. But we don't want to look at dozens of modifications at a time. We want a single annotation track. And we've developed methods that allow you to sort of translate the combinations of these marks into a single annotation track that basically talks about enhancer regions, these distal regulatory elements, promoter regions, proximal regulatory elements, transcribe regions, repressed regions, which I'm going to color code throughout the talk. And that allows us to now summarize this very rich information into a single annotation track, which we can now use to go across hundreds of epigenomes. Here, so here's 127 different tracks. Pax5 is the gene in the middle here. You can see that it's actually repressed in most of the cell types we look at, except for a handful where it turns on. Other genes are expressed in groups of related cell types. Others are expressed ubiquitously, 
And what you can also see is the difference in dynamics between promoter regions, which are usually on even when the gene is not transcribed, and enhancer regions, which basically come on and off very dynamically. And I'm going to focus your, uh, your attention on this region of the DNA. So if I have a genetic variant sitting in this region, I can basically see that that region turns on in very specific sets of cell types. But what's really interesting is that every time that one region turns on, the Pax5 gene also turns on. So you can actually start building a link between these regulatory regions and the genes that they might be targeting based on the correlated patterns of activity. So suddenly we can start predicting the target genes, jumping over multiple intermediate genes, as I'm going to show you um, in more detail soon. And this is one line of evidence, the functional correlated activity. Another line of evidence is the folding of DNA into three dimensions using a technique known as Hi-C, uh, Hi which basically looks at chromosomal interactions at a distance. And you can see these big domains surrounding the FTO gene where you have two million nucleotides wrapped around together in a bundle, suggesting that any of the genes within this region might actually be the target. And then the third line of evidence is genetic studies that basically look at EQTL information, expression, quantitative trait loci, that look at the correlation between genetic differences in a, in a regulatory region and expression differences across individuals, indicating that this regulatory region probably targets that particular gene. So we can use all that to now start linking enhancers to their target genes. We can also link enhancers to their upstream regulators through the motifs that they contain. So we can find enriched motifs in classes of coordinately active enhancers and use that to basically say that the HNF1B regulator controls enhancers active in liver, which again makes a lot of sense biologically. So armed with all this information, we can go back into regulatory regions that are associated with disease and basically say, what are all of the genetic variants? What are the enhancers that they overlap? Which cell types are these enhancers active in? What regulators control these enhancers? And what are the target genes that are controlled by these enhancers? So suddenly we have a living genome with a circuit diagram rather than just a blank, unannotated, non-coding region. And we can actually start making predictions about what are the target genes, what are the regulators, what are the mechanisms of action. And we put all of that information out there, again, in the spirit of sharing. All of this is in a database called haploreg for haplotype regulation. For any genetic variant of interest, it basically tells you who are all of its best friends that it's co-inherited with, all of the mutations that uh, they uh, are associated with, and whether they overlap evolutionarily conserved elements, promoters, enhancers, DNA accessible regions, binding of specific proteins, whether that mutation disrupts a regulatory motif associated with any of these regulators, and whether it overlaps a protein coding region as well. That allows you to now start mining disease data sets and epigenomic and functional genomic and transcriptomic data sets at a click of a button. And there are millions of people who have actually used this in their uh, everyday research. But we wanted to do a lot more than that. We wanted to basically be the users of our own predictions, uh, to uh, use a phrase from computer science, uh, eat our own dog food, because dog food would taste a lot better if we were the consumers of the tools that we produce. And we basically said, can we actually use that to gain insights into disease ourselves? And the first part was, can we actually look for enrichments in these regions that allows to prioritize specific tissues, regulators, cell types, and so on and so forth. So here's the approach that we took. We basically said, let's take every genetic trait and all of the SNPs, all of the single nucleotide polymorphisms that are associated with it, and do this for many traits at a time, using them as controls for each other. And then we can overlay the annotation of what are the enhancer regions active in different cell types and which of these traits do they overlap. In this particular case, stem cell enhancers preferentially overlap genetic variants that are associated with height but not with other traits, allowing us to put a check mark here as an enriched association. If you look at immune enhancers, they preferentially overlap type 1 diabetes traits, uh, uh, genetic variants associated with type 1 diabetes. If you look at heart enhancers, they preferentially overlap genetic variants associated with blood pressure. Liver enhancers preferentially overlap genetic variants associated with cholesterol. So that basically means that we can now start drawing a matrix of what traits and what cell types match with each other, which effectively tell us what cell types are relevant to the biology, to the pathophysiology of a disease in a completely unbiased manner. And in this particular case, they make a lot of sense. But what I want to show you is actually the actual data underlying this uh, toy matrix.
So now I'm gonna expand to 58 different trades on 127 different cell types, and this is what the data looks like. And I'm gonna point back to the same associations, height, embryonic stem cells, indeed, just like I showed you on the previous slide, and look at how white everything else is. This is kind of interesting. It basically says that genetic variants associated with height almost exclusively work in stem cells very early in our development. If you look at blood pressure, similarly, you see the same picture of almost anything, um, almost everything else is off, except for the left ventricle of the heart. If you look at cholesterol, you have this huge hit with liver. If you look at fasting glucose-related traits, you basically have the strongest hit associated with pancreatic islets. Again, for those who know about T2D biology, this actually makes a lot of sense. If you look at inflammatory bowel disease, you basically have the inflammatory component of T cells and B cells, and you also have the digestive component of bowel disease, which makes a lot of sense. So we can start taking some bets now. What about Alzheimer's, where you expect it to light up? Maybe brain. And actually, we just lost our bet because brain doesn't light up at all. Instead, we're finding the strongest association with CD14 plus monocytes. This is the mark that's associated with monocytes that infiltrate the brain during the blood-brain barrier breakdown during the regeneration. But also, this is the mark of microglial cells that are actually sitting in our brain even before our neurons develop and interact with these neurons, prune them, clean them up. And we collaborated with Li Hui Tsai in the Picker Institute to basically look at this more closely, looking at the progression of Alzheimer's disease in a mouse model. And what we found indeed is two types of changes, neuronal repression, immune activation. But the immune activation happened much earlier than the neuronal repression, indicating that in fact the immune changes are preceding the neuronal loss. And if you look at the genetic associations, they're simply absent from the uh, neurons and from the brain samples, both in adult and uh, embryonic stages, but they're extremely enriched, specifically in immune cells, indicating that the genetic basis of Alzheimer's disease is pointing to immune processes and inflammation rather than neuronal processes, which completely changes the therapeutic strategy that one takes against Alzheimer's disease. We've gone a lot further. We basically used uh, these Bayesian models for combining multiple traits at the same time through the linkage to equilibrium patterns, the GWAS summary statistics, the epigenomic annotations, in order to predict which genetic variants are causal and which annotations are causal. And this gives us very different pictures in different traits. If you look at Crohn's disease, you find that immune traits and uh, immune cell types are the most enriched, and that allows you to prioritize a different set of variants. If you look at schizophrenia, we find that central nervous system and brain processes are the most enriched, enabling us again to prioritize causal variants that fall within these regions. And if we look at this prioritization, we find that it captures conserved elements, it captures these and um, expression quantitative trait loci from the GTEx project. So they're much more enriched than if you just use the p-values of the genetics alone. But you can go a step further than that. You can basically say, great, I can look at the genome-wide significant signals up here and start prioritizing causal variants and mechanisms and so on. But once I learn what annotations are relevant to this group, can I then use it to actually look for additional genes and loci that do not reach genome-wide significance with current cohort sizes, but might one day reach genome-wide significance, can we now get a head start on the therapeutic development by, de by revealing these additional regions? So we built a machine learning uh, method that learns from the top loci what are the patterns that are meaningful of true GWAS hits that are biologically meaningful, and use that to predict additional regions that are sometimes a thousand times less likely than um, the genome-wide significant regions. And we can actually go in and start validating those experimentally. And we find that at the enhancer level, we can validate that indeed the SNPs look, lead to differences in activity between the wild type and the risk version. And that there are these enhancers actually form loops to specific promoters of nearby genes, enabling us to predict the target genes. So we can now look at the target genes themselves and go and see what does a mouse knockout phenotype look like. And indeed, these mouse knockout phenotypes are much more biologically meaningful than what you would expect using either epigenomic information alone or GWAS alone. And similarly, if you look at human phenotypes of a related trait, they're much more enriched. And if you go and perturb them directly in zebrafish, you basically find that indeed the change, the phenotype at the organismal level, exactly as we would expect in this particular case, heart repolarization duration.
So that allows us to now start painting a picture of how do these reference epigenome maps help interpret genetic variation. But epigenomics actually varies from person to person. My liver epigenome looks different than your liver epigenome, and it looks different when I'm sick or you know, when I'm out drinking and so on and so forth. So we can now start studying how does the epigenetic variation across individuals and across disease state correlates with both the genetic variation and the disease variation. The reason we're doing this is because the gap between genetic variation and disease in GWAS, in genome-wide association studies, is extremely large. We're basically looking for small single nucleotide changes and how they affect an entire organism. And because evolutionary selection is hard at work excluding the mutations that are detrimental, these end up being very small effects. They're the only ones that actually escape selection. And that's why everything we find from GWAS is usually a small effect. But we can now start bridging this gap by actually asking what about these intermediate phenotypes? If I look at a specific tissue, a specific enhancer element, a specific you know, gene expression, or endophenotypes, can I now start building a map of these intermediate phenotypes on the way to disease? And the reason why these are so important is because they're more oligogenic. There are fewer genetic variants controlling them, and these genetic variants are allowed to have a stronger effect because evolution does not select strongly at this intermediate level, it selects strongly at the disease level. So that allows us to now start learning something about these processes and these intermediate phenotypes with much smaller cohorts and then turn around and apply it to much, much larger cohorts. The challenge, of course, is that the disease itself and the environment might affect those intermediate traits and we no longer have the unidirectionality that we had with genetic studies, but we can overcome this. So in the context of Alzheimer's disease, we collaborated with David Bennett and Phil de Jaeger to basically study the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex methylation patterns of a cohort of 723 individuals who have been followed for more than 10 years with cognitive evaluations and a rich set of phenotypes. And then we looked at how the genetic variation correlates with epigenetic variation to discover methylation, quantitative trait loci, how the epigenome correlates with disease to do a methylome-wide association study, and of course, combining the three to look at causality. When we look at the first part, how genetic variation correlates with methylation variation, we find 50,000 significant methyl QTLs. This is the genome-wide significance threshold down here after bone ferronic correction. Up here it says 10 to the minus 300. So they're dramatically predictive of the methylation level of these individuals. But what's really interesting now is that we can use this G2M relationship between genetics and methylation and start predicting methylation in a much larger cohort of individuals. Why is this important? Because if I only do a methylome-wide association study, I have bidirectionality. Some of these methylation changes are simply downstream of the disease, and the arrow is pointing in the other direction. But if I look at predicted methylation from the genetics, then this is actually a causal arrow on the way to, gen to, to phenotype. So that basically means that I can now start predicting methylation in my much larger cohort and specifically look at the genetic component of methylation and also as a freebie basically get the specific regulatory region that is responsible for that link. So when we go now in chromosome 6, for example, we see that there was only one genome-wide significant hit that was actually just slightly below the genome-wide significance. And if you now look at this methylome wide association study using the imputed methylation from multiple SNPs, you now start getting a lot of genome-wide significant hits. So we are revealing new regions associated with disease. The other thing we're doing is actually looking at combinations of genetic variants that together predict methylation. We're in looking at combinatorics using genetic data alone is almost impossible because of the statistical burden of multiple hypothesis testing. We can now do that with methylation only, or we can also include transcription as an intermediate phenotype on the way to disease and look at multiple links together. We can do that with surrogate tissues. I can measure methylation in blood and use that together with genetics to predict methylation in the brain and now start associating that down. I can do that across multiple phenotypes together, where I can look at neuritic plaques, neurofibrillary tangles, neuroinflammation, and the signatures that they have in the genome. And what we find, actually, quite surprisingly, is that they paint different sets of regions. And these regions are active in different cell types. Some of these combinations of phenotypes act in embryonic stem cells, other in immune cells, other in brain. And 
the genes associated with these processes are actually involved in different pathways. So that basically means that disease can be start, can, we can start breaking down complex traits into their simpler individual phenotypes. And we can do that across an entire clinical record. We can basically take all of the electronic health records of you know, large cohorts, start predicting what are the intermediate variables, the meta phenotypes, if you wish, that allow you to now start predicting missing phenotypes with 80% accuracy. Basically say you should take this new test because I'm predicting that you're probably gonna test positive. Or maybe you should retake that test because you know, I don't believe the result because it's not consistent with your other phenotypic uh, measurements. And you can actually start carrying out genome-wide association studies with, a me with a meta phenotypes or with the imputed phenotypes. And we've shown that this actually increases uh, the strength of associations. And then the last thing we can do is now take all of that information together to start dissecting disease loci. So as I mentioned earlier, the first thing you want to know is what is the tissue and the cell type where that genome-wide gen genome association study is acting. Um, then you want to know what are the target genes downstream of the genetic variants associated with that trait. What is the causal nucleotide or set of nucleotides that is responsible for that association? Who are the upstream regulators whose binding changes when that nucleotide changes? and what are the cellular phenotypes ensuing from the downstream genes, and what are the organismal phenotypes. So I'm going to walk you through these steps in the case of FTO. And this is joint work with Melina Klausnitzer, which was published a year ago in the New England Journal of Medicine. So obesity, as you know, is the strongest plague in our society. It basically accounts for about a third of expenses in our healthcare system. In the U.S. alone, it affects 500, uh, in, in, acro across the world, it affects 500 million people, and it costs $200 billion a year in the U.S. alone. So the strongest genetic association is in this FTO gene that I showed you in the first slide, and it contains 89 non-coding variants and no coding variants. So a lot of work focused on FTO itself. It's expressed in the brain, so people assumed that it plays a control in appetite regulation or whether you're interested in exercising or not, but we found a different story. When we looked at our epigenomic maps, we found that this region of association is specifically active in mesenchymal stem cells that are derived from adipose tissue. And these are the stem cells that are the progenitors of both white adipocytes and beige adipocytes. White adipocytes are your worst enemy. They're the ones that make us chubby. You basically store lipids inside these white fat cells that basically enlarge. And it's a fantastic process if you're in pre periods of starvation because you're storing these high energy molecules for a rainy day. Of course, today when we're surrounded by high energy food, this is actually a huge problem. Beige adipocytes are your best friend. They're basically able to burn calories in, as heat in a process known as thermogenesis, a depolarization of the mitochondrial membrane that leads to a uh, change in the proton gradient and loss of energy as heat rather than storing it as ATP. So we basically said, okay, great, it might be uh, this tissue, what are the target genes? And here's the region of association. You see here how it localizes very well within the FTO gene, and there's a lot of barriers to any other gene nearby when you only look at genetic data. But when you look at the high C information of the linking and the looping of chromatin, you basically see these massive domains of 3D folding, suggesting that any of these genes could actually be targets. And we went specifically in adipose tissue from risk and non-risk homozygous individuals, and we asked, is there a genotype-dependent change in expression? And what we found is that the risk individuals show a two-fold increase in the expression of two genes, 500 KB away and 1.2 million nucleotides away. What are these genes doing? They're correlated with lipid metabolism and mitochondrial function. And when we look at the cellular phenotypes of these individuals, we find that indeed the risk individuals have fewer mitochondria and larger adipocytes. And what about the causal variant? We basically looked at uh, evolutionary conservation, and we were able to pinpoint the genetic alteration to a single motif of the AT-rich interaction domain, ARID5V protein, where a T2C mutation leads to lack of binding of that repressor and overactivation of that enhancer and overactivation of RX3 and RX5. So we now have a complete circuitry that allows us to now go from a region of association to a very detailed mechanism and we can now start intervening. We can actually start modulating these knobs that genetics gave us together with the epigenomic analysis. So we can knock down and overexpress the target genes, knock down and overexpress the upstream regulator, and even use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing to change the predicted causal nucleotide from T to C and C to T in risk and non-risk individuals. And what we find is really striking. 
what we find is that if you revert the C mutation in the risk individuals into a T, you restore the process of thermogenesis that was simply broken in the risk individuals. That's precision medicine right there, a single nucleotide out of 3.2 billion nucleotides. When you take the target gene, IRX3, and you build a dominant negative reporter in mouse, you basically find that these mice, the IRX3 dominant negative mice expressed in adipose tissue, lose 50% of their body weight, and when you put them on a high-fat diet, they're simply unable to gain weight. These do not change their appetite, they do not change their exercise level, all they do is simply burn more energy when they're awake and even when they're sleeping. So how do we start doing this in very high throughput? We've basically developed this massively parallel reporter assay technology for mining individual regulatory regions down to their specific uh, nucleotides that are important for activation or for repression. We're able to now go and perturb individual nucleotides associated with disease 10,000 at a time and 100,000 at a time to basically look at the effect on reporter gene activity. We're able to take the target genes and basically differentiate stem cells into different cell lines and see where do they have phenotypes, where do they lead to changes in gene expression in chromatin in cellular phenotypes. We're able to now start perturbing systematically using CRISPR-Cas9 or RNAi those genes in high throughput cellular assays in 384 well plates measure calcium signaling for a large number of different um, genes associated, predicted to be associated with schizophrenia. And we're able to now build circuits that incorporate these genes into viruses that sense the environment of that cell to match the cell type, the cellular state, the genotype, or the disease state, and release either an overactivation or a repression of the gene of interest. And we are able to now use these circuits as therapeutics where they can sense cancer cells, rewire cancer cells, recruit the immune system, and successfully kill the cancer in vivo in collaboration with Ron Weiss's lab at MIT. So this is the path that we have to go through. Understand the circuitry of the non-coding genome, identify the relevant tissues, variants, and regulators, combine genetic and epigenetic variation together, and then start uncovering and manipulating the disease mechanism and carrying this out in high throughput to basically develop new therapeutics. And that creates a new ecosystem where we can bridge the gap between NIH and industry by basically starting to collaborate much more extensively, as we heard earlier, in the discovery, the manipulation, and the therapeutic development in a large number of disease areas. So this will allow new technologies, new molecules and collaborations, and new funding models. With that, I'll stop, acknowledge an incredible group of collaborators, and I'll be happy to take any questions.